Chapter 9, Managing Data Storage We've all been at this 21st century thing for a while, and by now it's pretty clear that data is the big driver of, well, of everything. Governments build their policies around economic and population data. Scientists build their theories around environmental, physical, and biological data. Businesses build their plans around production, sales, and consumer behavior data. Data is being generated at rates previously undreamed of. I've read that the sensors on a pair of General Electric engines on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner generate a terabyte of data each day. A single network-connected car, like a Tesla, might upload around 100 megabytes of location, performance, and maintenance-related data on an average day. Multiply that by the millions of such cars that will soon be in use around the world, and multiply that number by the thousands of other devices that are out there, and the scale of the data problem should be clear. Got plans to add your own data to the flood? And you feel the need to save it and store it too? You'll need to be able to explain why you need it, so you'll know how it should be done. I can't help you with the why, but I think I can give you some useful thoughts about the how. The way you store data will depend on what it looks like as it's being produced and how you need to access it later. Where you store your data will depend on how much of it there is, how deeply you'd be impacted by its loss, and how often you'll need to take it out and play with it. Let's take a look at both of those variables. Data storage formats. Since not all data is created equal, it'll make some sense to look for the tools and environments that'll most closely match the work you're planning to do. Here are some options. Spreadsheets. They may be flashy, colorful, consumer-facing applications, but spreadsheets are no lightweights when it comes to serious data processing. As we'll see in more detail a bit later, spreadsheets have their limitations. But when it comes to presenting data in visually accessible ways, applying mathematical, statistical, and financial operations to that data, and even integrating remote data sources like stock market quotes, no other tool comes close. Spreadsheets can import simple, plain text data from files of just about any size, as long as the text can be delimited. That is, breaks between data divisions should be marked by some consistent character. When you import your data, you can specify the appropriate delimiter. Tabs, hard returns, and commas are common delimiting characters. In fact, the popular acronym CSV stands for Comma Separated Values. Spreadsheets display their data in cells, which are arranged into horizontal rows and vertical columns. Functions can be applied to the contents of individual cells or to some or all of the cells in a column or row, and can incorporate values in cells in relative locations. Data sets within a spreadsheet can be rendered as graphs. Spreadsheets can be used as web forms, where users can input data that's saved for future use. The most popular spreadsheet is probably Microsoft's Excel, which is part of their Microsoft 365 Office Suite. But feature for feature, the open source Calc that comes with the LibreOffice Suite is a viable alternative. Google Sheets is a cloud-based spreadsheet solution that may lack some of the feature depth of the others, but is a strong collaboration tool. Databases. As a rule, databases are not built for visualizing data in attractive and intuitive formats. And on their own, they're not known for complex mathematical calculations either. But boy, can they handle extra-large data sets and multi-table relationships. When I say that databases don't really help you visualize your data, that's generally because they're meant to be used behind front-end applications in multi-tier deployments. For instance, an e-commerce website will display web pages where users can browse what you've got for sale, add items to a virtual shopping cart, and check out using their payment information. The web page itself just draws a graphical interface and shows you where to click your mouse. But the information about the items you're selling, including their price and associated images, are probably retrieved from a back-end database whenever the page loads. Similarly, your selections and eventually payment information will be written to a different database. The software process that handles your shipping might later consult the payment database for the shipping address. Databases are there at every stage, but no one will ever actually see them. 
Administrating large databases so they're efficient, secure, and reliable takes serious engineering, and in some cases, an enormous amount of money. Before you build your database deployment, you'll need to know whether your operation requires strong atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, known together as ACID, and support for complex and flexible queries. If it does, you may be looking for a relational database engine like SQL Server, MariaDB, or Amazon's Aurora. Or perhaps you need speedy performance and would prefer a more flexible, schemaless environment, suggesting you'd be better off with a NoSQL solution like MongoDB or Redis. SQL, by the way, stands for Structured Query Language, which is an established syntax for using language-like code for interacting with your data. Counterintuitively, depending on who you ask, NoSQL might not stand for not SQL. Some prefer to think of it as not only SQL instead. Jupyter Notebook. Don't think you have to consume your data using the same tool that's storing it. It's possible, for example, to import existing data that's stored either locally or at a remote site into an interactive compute environment like a Jupyter Notebook. The advantage of this kind of setup is that the data can now be addressed within the context of, say, a robust Python programming environment without actually touching or potentially corrupting the original source. The open source Jupyter Lab is a popular resource for working with large data sets using Python. You can download and build your own JupyterLab, or run it remotely through a cloud provider like Amazon's Elastic MapReduce service, or Microsoft's Azure Notebooks. For particularly large data sets, especially those that already live in the cloud, an existing cloud platform can make sense. Data Storage Devices Although it's not quite this simple, let's say that there are Four broad categories of data storage media drives. Magnetic tape on open reels, cartridges, or cassettes. Optical, including compact disc, CD, and digital video disc, DVD. Magnetic media in 2.5 and 3.5 inch drive casing, including spinning hard drives. And solid state, including SSD drives in 2.5 and 3.5 inch drive casing, SD cards, and USB flash drives. A few magnetic tape systems may still exist here and there, but the days of laboriously and slowly copying large data sets to banks of multiple backup tapes and hoping the backup would actually work if you ever needed it are pretty much over. Trust me, no one is complaining. CDs and DVDs are headed in the same direction. Their maximum capacities are no match for the sheer volume of today's enterprise data needs, and consumers don't make local copies of nearly as many large media files as they once did which leaves spinning magnetic and solid-state drives. Gigabyte for gigabyte, spinning drives are probably still a bit less expensive than their solid-state equivalents, although the price difference is narrowing. But the performance gains delivered by SSDs are very noticeable. Some time ago, I realized that I could actually save money by buying smaller capacity SSDs for my personal workstations and laptops instead of larger hard disk drives. Let me explain. The way we use data on our personal computers has changed in recent years. Rather than storing media and software archives locally, we're much more likely to assume they'll be available to stream or download whenever we need them. For most of us, faster download speeds have made living in the cloud easy, so we normally just don't need as much storage space anymore. The 500 gigabyte SSD drive plugged into my busy workstation is barely half full, even taking into account the dozen or so virtual machines and the many ISO images I've got there. And the drive cost me less than I would have paid for a 1 or 2 terabyte spinning hard drive. One of the primary roles of storage is data backup. Rather than physically transferring backups between media, local data archiving generally works by moving archives across networks. The trick is designing a backup system that automatically provides you with sufficient duplicates of your archives rotates them through artificial life cycles, where eventually they're retired and destroyed, and all without generating unnecessary network traffic overhead. Besides backups, you'll also want to share data among users working throughout your campus. Two tools for managing both backups and file sharing are Network Attached Storage, NAS, and Storage Area Networks, SAN. Their similar names suggest they're in the same business. Trust me, they're not. Network Attached Storage 
NAS is a relatively simple and inexpensive way to share files across a local network. It runs through a standalone server device that contains multiple storage drives. The drives will normally be configured as a redundant array of inexpensive disks, known as RAID, to provide redundancy and performance benefits. The NAS device connects to the network over Ethernet cabling and uses regular TCP IP networking. Client machines in the LAN will see the NAS resources through standard file sharing protocols like Server Message Block, SMB, and Network File System, NFS. NAS solutions can be great for smaller home or office environments, but the fun will quickly fade as your infrastructure grows. NAS devices themselves are generally not powerful enough to handle too much of a client workload, and working with large files over an Ethernet network may slow things down. Storage Area Network If NAS setups were relatively simple and inexpensive, SANS, storage area networks, are complex and expensive. Not by accident were they designed for large enterprise deployments. As a result of the high-end hardware you throw into a SAN, performance will be great and you'll scale much further. Rather than Ethernet, SANs run through much faster fiber channel switches, or sometimes the slower iSCSI. They provide block-based storage rather than file systems and are mounted on client machines as local drives. Data Storage Services As internet connection speeds have improved, it's become more practical to move at least some data archives to the cloud. Instead of local backups, which could be lost in a catastrophic event like a fire, data could be regularly saved to online platforms. Once there, you'd have a viable off-site backup. But if you wanted, you'd also have access to that data from anywhere on Earth. If you work remotely with a distributed team, that could be helpful. You probably already own and have even collaborated on documents that live in Dropbox, Microsoft 365, or Google Drive. For most people, the primary point of interaction for those services is a web browser. But serious data management, or even relatively complex and regular file backups, aren't practical within a browser. So cloud computing providers offer storage and archiving services whose administration can be scripted and automated. Cloud storage services like Amazon's Simple Storage Service, S3, provide full archive lifecycle management. Data that must remain highly available could, for example, be saved to the S3 standard storage class. After a few months, when you're less likely to need the data, but must still retain a copy for regulatory reasons, you could move your archive to the cheaper S3 Glacier class. Data in Glacier is secure and durable, but would take much longer to access if retrieval became necessary. After a full year, you might be able to delete it altogether. Better yet, there are simple ways to automate the way your data moves through its lifecycle. All major cloud providers will have their own comparable data service storages. Naturally, prices and exact service features will differ from one another. And of course, feature and pricing details will often change. It may not always be practical to transfer data to the cloud over the internet. Extremely large data sets can take a very long time to upload, even using fast internet connections. Sure, if you're lucky enough to have a fiber optics connection giving you one gigabyte per second, then a one terabyte upload would only take two and a half hours or so, assuming nobody else was using the connection. But what about a hundred terabytes of data? That'll take you more than 10 days. And what if you only get 100 megabytes per second? More than three months. Obviously, if you're uploading jumbo-sized archives weekly or have other uses for your internet connection, then uploading isn't an option. For such cases, you can still get your data into the cloud, but it'll have to find another ride. AWS, as it turns out, offers their Snow family of services. Snowball is a large, secure storage device. It can be safely shipped to AWS customers, loaded up with dozens of terabytes of data, and then ship back. Once back home at Amazon, the data will be directly uploaded to a bucket in the customer's S3 account. Alternatively, snowballs can be kept on location and used as edge compute devices. Snowball's big brother is AWS Snowmobile, a 45-foot long secure shipping container capable of handling exabyte scale digital migration. Snowball's little cousin, AWS Snowcone is a rugged container the size of a tissue box 
that can handle 8 terabytes of usable storage, along with the possibility of virtual cloud instances and network connectivity to the AWS cloud. Besides transferring your data, snow cones can be used as highly mobile edge compute devices in their own right.